Well, good morning. Welcome to today's Sabbath service. Today is the second Sabbath of the sixth month on God's calendar. So we are literally two weeks away from the Feast of Trumpets. And so I just wanted to make sure you guys know that. And I'm going to also take off my virtual background so we can see me clearly. All right, there you go. So uh, we are the second Sabbath of the sixth month, which means uh, two weeks. On Sunday, we're going to be the first day that we're going to celebrate the Feast of Trumpets. Now, we know that the Feast of Trumpets could be a two-day feast, so we don't know if it's going to be actually on Sunday, because it would be on Sunday. Or if we spot the new moon on, on Monday, then it'll, I mean, on Sunday night, we'll, that means the actual feast will be on Monday. But we won't know that till the end of the month, which means it happens to be the day that no man knows. Isn't that interesting in the Bible? Uh, the Feast of Trumpets happens to land on the day that no man knows because that day is a day that could be one of two days. And that's the only feast that lands on an exact day that no man knows. Even though the Day of Atonement, we don't know that day yet either. Or um, the same thing with the Feast of Tabernacles is seven days in that feast as well. But the Feast of Trumpets is a very unique feast. But today what we're going to be going through is something that God put up my heart just a few minutes ago. You know, I didn't know what the message was going to be about today, but God said, okay, this is what the message is going to be about. And I said, okay, and I wrote the scriptures. So before I talk about that, I want to just go through a couple things with you, just to let you know a little bit, a few things. One of them is about what's happening on Facebook. And by the way, this is our, our website, savedbytruth.com. If you're new to our ministry, you're more than welcome to go to our website, savedbytruth.com. Uh, this is, you can learn all about our lessons here. Um, people would like to donate and, and offer, give an offering, they can do it there. And then you can go ahead and register here. When you register there, you can actually get some of our Bible studies. You can get um, some PowerPoints that you can download and some of our flyers and all of our messages. All the information is there free. You go ahead and just join there if you want. This video, I'd strongly recommend you to watch. This is a nine-minute video I just did the other day um, to really letting people know about the uh, call to action right now, which is to gather people that really want to teach this truth about the Bible to the world. So you can go there and watch that little video and it'll give you some insights on our ministry. Uh, down here a little bit tells about our ministry and what we're all about. Here it talks about the mission, which is um, the covenant, which is the commandments and baptism. It goes into detail on that. And these pictures, you can click them and they'll pop up bigger so you can actually read the scriptures. So just to learn a little bit about our website as well. And then down here, you can go and see some of the people that we serve in Africa, India. Now we're in South America. We've gone down to South America. I've been learning Spanish every day. I've been listening to Spanish videos and stuff, learning Spanish every day. I'm, I'm a little rusty, but I'm just starting to work through it and starting to get, get my, my vocabulary down. So I'm working on it, you know, on a consistent basis. But we are down in India and Africa and many different places in Australia. And, and now we're going to South America. Like I said, we've been chipping away, going to every single country on earth right now. And then down here a little further, very important videos. This, this, these videos are very important to watch. One of them is about baptism, the truth about baptism, because that's one of the biggest deceptions on earth right now. The second one is about the Ten Commandments. That's another big deception. And about the Lord's Sabbath day. Those three videos I would recommend you to watch. You can also share them out because they're YouTube videos. So you can share them with people. And then this video right here is about the big deception that they're doing right now, of what their plan is. The first 30 seconds is really telling because in the first 30 seconds, they tell us that their plan is to basically eliminate half the population by next year. The people that took this the thing in their arm, the jab, um, that's what it's talking about. And then here, of course, you can learn about the Sabbath day. Okay. So just wanted. To, oh, by the way, I need to change that out. I keep forgetting to do that. I need to do that. That's the sixth day, Sabbath. And then you can watch some additional videos about some of the people that we serve and, and things that we're doing around the world. So just wanted to let you know about our website. If you're new to our channel, um, just please go visit our website, learn all about us and what we're doing around the world. The next thing I want to share is um, what's happening on Facebook. Just so you guys know, we have two Facebook ads running, one with Jamie doing a video. That video's got about 60,000 um, hits on it already. People that liked it or clicked on it or watched it or listened to the information. It's been pretty amazing, the, the numbers. And it's very little uh, cost because we're getting a very high amount of views for very little cost. So that's been really, really good. The second thing that we have another video that's going out with my video on it and with my information on it. And that video is getting uh, amazing results too. Um, I think last night I looked at about 20,000 uh, results, about 200 clicks. But the key is it was only about unbelievable because we're using, you know, Daniel's account and that's from Nigeria. 
So our cost has been less than like $3. <laughs> Unbelievable how much the results are for very little money. So we're hoping over the next two weeks that can expand exponentially. And then the last thing I want to touch on is this is our group, God's Warriors for Christ. God put it on my heart about a week ago to open up a private group specifically for evangelists, pastors, disciples that really want to share the message of truth. I have all the questions about baptism, about the commandments, that they believe it. And so everyone that comes into this group has to say yes that they believe these things. So in literally a week, we put 559 people in this group. And that's growing exponentially. And then I can talk to these people and I teach them about the Sabbath. I teach them about the covenant and everything. So one of the things you guys can do to help grow the ministry is invite people to this group. You can go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash God's Warriors for Christ and invite people there. And that's what all of our pastors are doing. We're trying to get to a thousand by the beginning of the week because we know once we had a thousand pastors and evangelists in there, that can turn to 2,000 to 5,000, 10,000. And then we'll get to all four corners of the earth because the Lord says that's what has to happen before he comes to get his first fruit. And I intend on doing that. And that's what our intent is. And that's what the brothers in the Bible and in our ministry, their intent is as well. Two other things I want to show you. Um, these are some of the orphans. Remember we talked about, we had orphans that, um, you know, all the, all the brothers that died, um, that got killed in, in Nigeria. Well, this is where Daniel and his wife, they actually made outfits for a lot of the kids. And it's so encouraging because all the kids now, they're orderly, they're sitting there, hair done, looking clean. Um, Daniel's been taking care of these, these kids over there for us. And I'm sure he probably has a staff. It looks like he has a staff of people there helping out. But it's just amazing what these brothers do over there. I mean, they talk about dying to yourself. I can't imagine taking on 175 orphans in one day. <laughs> I, I can't imagine doing that. I can't imagine taking on two cats in one day, let alone 175 people. You know, but they are somehow, God is providing the increase. He's feeding them. He's he got them housed. He, he's taking care of them. And, man, I just wish I had a heart and, and the ability that Daniel does. Man, Daniel and the brothers over there in, in Africa, not just Daniel, you know, a lot of the brothers and sisters over there, <clears throat> Talk about loving your neighbor. I've never seen anybody love their neighbor more than these people, than the brothers and sisters over there in these countries. So, you know, keep, your, keep them in prayer. I just want you to see where your money goes. When you guys give an offering, and I appreciate all of you that do, and you give a tithe or whatever, you know, I want you to know where your money goes. This is where it goes. It goes to help the brothers and sisters that are in need right now because, you know, we're, we're all in a challenging situation, but these brothers and sisters over there really are under a little bit of a challenge. And then, this is a little short video um, that Daniel just sent me. Uh, I guess an 80 year old lady was homeless beggar and she wanted to eat. And he just sent me this video, it's about one minute long, I'm just gonna play it real quick. But I don't know what happened, I haven't seen it yet, but it's something about that she just um, started to believe in Jesus. So I'm sure she'll be getting baptized really soon. I guess um, Daniel's been teaching. These orphans, take them.
So I just wanted to share that with you just so you guys can see what a disciple looks like. You know, that's what a disciple looks like. A disciple out there making disciples, teaching them the scriptures, baptizing them for the forgiveness of their sins, which I'm sure she'll probably be getting baptized very, very soon. So I just wanted to share that with you because, you know, that's what we need to be doing, you guys. We, we, and that's what we are doing around the world. And so I just wanted to share that with you because uh, our ministry around the world is, you know, we don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of, we don't have any buildings. We don't have anything. But what we do have, have is the most important thing. We have the love of Christ. And so uh, I just wanted to share that. And then also I want to share some good news about our family um, really quick. You know, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about God giving us the desires of our heart. That was last week's message. And, you know, I want to share because my family, God's been giving us the desires of our heart in different ways. And so I just want to share it real quick. My wife has been awesome. Uh, you know, she's gotten the desires of our heart back. And let me tell you what that is. When we were young and in the singles, she used to lead the, the women. She used to lead uh, all the singles women. And I used to lead the men in, in the singles. And she was kind of the, the forerunner of that because I was really shy back then and she wasn't. So she would get up and do the messages and she would share it. And then I kind of like be the one kind of running behind her when we first got when I first got baptized. And so, but, you know, after, you know, we got out of, got married and then things happened and she had kids and, you know, she kind of strayed away from that a little bit. Not as much as she used to be, but her first love back then was loving the Lord and, and loving the, the women and loving people and taking care of them. And God gave her her first love back because she created this event here by faith and right in our neighborhood. And she invited some women. She went on our, our web, on our website and just put, her, put it out there. And boom, God brought the increase. Like 30, 40, 50 women said, yes, I want to do it. And they, they signed up. And she's like had to create a second event because she had so many people registered for this event. So pray for that event that some of the, some of the people there will be excited about the truth. And she can get some, uh, some of the more people here in our neighborhood uh, to, to get their sins forgiven and, get, and make it as a first fruit. And then also, in addition to that, she also got a, a radio show. So not only is she broadcasting it locally, she's broadcasting it all over the world in a hundred and something countries around the world. So she's able to do her own show where she's speaking about God and she's speaking about the truth and she's taking that message to women all around the world on a radio show that was just handed to her on a silver platter. She prayed for something and God gave it to her because that was the desires of her heart. And I just really appreciate her faith and her commitment to God to do what she needs to do. That's what I fell in love with when we got married. It's her passion for the Lord. And so I'm so excited about that for her. And I know she's excited as well. And then also, really excited for my daughter, Jaden, because, you know, she's getting back her first love, which is her youthfulness, her excitement, her friendships. She gets to go back to California. She gets to go have some time with her friends. And she's been spending time with her friends here. She has more friends here than she had back then. She's just, just meeting people. She got to go to um, the other day to Universal Studio with Maddox and meet one of her old friends from, from back in California there. And she got one of our other friends, Serena. She met her there. And it's just so encouraging that she's getting our youthful excitement and her, and her enthusiasm back where you know her first love and her and her relationship with God as well and then the same thing with Maddox Maddox is awesome because you know God, today it was amazing we were able to go to his school he's been praying to go to school now you gotta understand my son's been homeschooled his whole life his whole you know since he was like in kindergarten but now in high school he's just getting high school and so we, there's a brand new high school right around the corner from our house and so uh, God made a way for him to be able to go to the school. So um, today we went to orientation. We walked through the school. It's a brand new school. And it was really cool because, you know, he's going to have a fun time there for the time that we're here. And it's going to be awesome for him to be able to do that. That was his, his uh, you know, the desires of his heart. And God blessed him the desires of his heart. Not only that, his leg is healed. The doctor just gave him a release so that he can play basketball again. And so God gave him the desires of his heart also. And last one I want to talk about is my mom. Um, my mom got the desires of her heart because she's never been to a prom in a high school. She never went to a prom. But the other day, they had a thing called a senior prom. You know, like when you're a senior in high school, you get a senior prom. But these are seniors because she goes to this senior center where there's like 800 or 500 or something women there or men, and men that are over, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old. And they just hang out and have fun. That's where she is today. She's over there hanging out, having fun with them. And, you know, she's um, hopefully maybe will be on this message. But they had a thing called a senior prom where they all got up, they got dressed like in their prom outfits and they went to dance and they had fun. And she was so grateful that she did. And we got some awesome pictures. Maybe Jamie can share those pictures later. But it was so awesome because, you know, she was telling, my, she was telling Jamie that she's so excited that, you know, she was able to come back and live with us again and get her own place again. 
and she got the desires of her heart by her own place. She got the desires of her heart. She's around all these women and men and friends that she can make impact with. And she just loved me. She was just so grateful that God just gave her what she wanted in the last days, which was the desires of her heart. And so I'm so encouraged about that. And, you know, we've been praying for that. But if you don't if you don't look at what you have in your life, you don't look at the simple things, then you won't see that God is giving you the desires of her heart. He says in the last days that we're going to come out with great possession. Well, see, we think that great possession is a lot of money. Well, the Bible says it's hard for a rich man to get to the kingdom of God. I don't want a lot of money. <laughs> I don't, right now, if they gave me a billion dollars, I'd be as quick as I could to get that money out. Why? Because it says it's hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. He says, what good is it if you have all the money in the world, but you're not rich towards God? And I can tell you right now, all of us are rich towards God. And that's why this, you know, it's so exciting. And for me, God has definitely given me the desires of my heart. And I'll just tell you what those are. My number one is my first love. He's given me my first love back, which was my, my relationship with my father. My father, God. And he has given me the relationship. I mean, for the last eight months, it's been unbelievable the conversations I've had with God. I go to the gym and I'll stay there three or four hours with my headset on and sometimes with my headset off, just having in-depth conversations with God about what's happening in the kingdom of God and what's happening in the future, what's happening on earth and, and the, the videos that he wants me to watch and just, you, you have no idea the conversations. I feel, you know, like when we talked about Moses was walking and walked with God and God would be speaking to him and and, and or, or, you know, Moses walked with God or Enoch walked with God. Yes, it, it feels like that. Now, I might be crazy. And if I am, then you, you can send me to the loony bin. But I can tell you right now, I don't think so. I think God's been talking to me as, as, as clear as I'm talking to you. And so the conversations I've had, it's been unbelievable. And so it's been really refreshing. It's been fun. So I've got my first love back. And, and let me tell you what that's done for me. It softened my heart. You know, I've been listening to um, songs from my youth when I was in high school, uh, when I was a little bit older in high school. You know, a lot of the songs were, you know, like Babyface or Keith Sweat or, you know, some of them were love songs or whatever. But, you know, I, I kind of turned them around. And so I'm singing them to God. And, and, you know, it's just amazing how much softer my heart is. I cry. It, you can't imagine being at the gym, working out and tears flowing down your eyes at the gym. It's crazy. I'm serious. I'm sitting here talking to God or I'm singing to God. Or I'm just singing, singing, you know, about, you know, certain things. And it's, my heart is just so softened right now. And, and it's, it's been refreshing. It's been refreshing because I haven't felt that in probably 30 years, 30 something years. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that. And then I'm also getting my body back in shape. That's my, that was another desire of my heart. I'm actually running again, which I haven't been able to run in about 15 years. I'm running. I'm in probably the best shape I've been in in probably since I was in my 20s. And I'm having fun again. You know, I was able to go down to Miami, ride my bike, and we're about to go again for the feast. And i just been, you know, riding my bike in the neighborhood and just enjoying life again. And I'm so excited about that. And so I just want you guys to know that God will give you the desires of your heart. But you got to look for them and you got to go enjoy them. So today's lesson is called remember your first love so you want to take some notes you want to write down the scriptures write down the the title of the lesson is called remember your first love and we're going to go through the scriptures first of all here's the verse of the day it says do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the holy spirit who is in you of course baptized disciples of jesus have the holy spirit in them so that's why the scripture is talking to you whom you have received from god you are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You know, this is probably my theme scripture for this six months because that's exactly what I've been doing. That's why I've been going to the gym like a crazy man. The people in there must think I'm either insane or something because they can't figure out how in the heck am I working out twice as hard as anyone in there. I'm in there twice as long and I work out twice as hard. I'm sweating half hour into it and I'm just working like running around from gym, machine to machine. People literally think I'm nuts in there. Some of the older guys are like, what the heck is wrong with this dude? Because they can't tell, they can't figure out why I'm so excited. Well, I'm excited because I'm taking care of the temple. And I want to present this temple the best possible way I can when I meet Jesus face to face. And so that's exactly why I'm doing it. I have a motivation like you can't imagine because I know what's going on, and why it's going on, and when it's going on. So I'm excited about that. So we're talking about your first love. 
So what should our first love be? Let's look. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus 20. I'm going to go back to what our first love needs to be. And remember, we're in the same position right now as the Israelites were. The Israelites, when Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt, they were in slavery, they were in bondage, they were people over them, they were lording over them, they were making them build bricks and build pyramids, and they were enslaved, right? And then Moses, God told Moses, sent a man to go tell him to let my people go, and they let the people go. They went through the Red Sea, which was their baptism. They received, they had the Holy Spirit with them. They had a, in a cloud, and they were alive. It was alive with the, um, you know, the, the cloud and then the, pillar, the the fire in the front, right? And then they were going, they went through the Red Sea, and then Moses went up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments was a covenant, a marriage covenant between God and his people. So this is what it says here. And God spoke all these words. So I want you to remember... Have the mindset, Jesus is sitting right here in the living room, and we're paying attention to what God says. It says that God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So Jesus is God and was with God and is who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He just had not become flesh yet. So that's the first thing we got to realize. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. So that is the first love right there. The first love that you need to have is that you need to have no other gods before God himself and Jesus Christ. No other God. In other words, nothing should be more important. You shouldn't love anything more. You should not want to desire something more. You shouldn't want to be around something more. Something shouldn't be more prevalent in your life than your relationship with God. I can tell you right now, there's nothing or no one. No one more prevalent or more important in my life than my relationship with God. Everyone could leave. And I mean everyone <laughs> could leave me. And I'd be 100% okay. Here's why. Because my number one love, my number one priority is my relationship with my Father in Heaven and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's it. That is number one. Everything else it's almost like the Bible says in Luke 14, Luke 14, verse 26, it says, it's almost as if I hate him. You got to hate your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your wife, your children, even your own life. Or you can't even be considered my disciple. That needs to be your first love. You're not your spouse, not your friends, not your family, not your job, not your career, not your money, not your retirement program. Nothing should be more important and prevalent in your life than your relationship with God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the first love that you need to have. And so I want to go through these four, the first four, because how do you love God? Let's talk about it. Number one, it says, do not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me, and here it is, and keep my commandments. So who does he show love to? Those who keep his commandments. Who does he consider hates him? Those who break his commandments. See, for, from God's perspective, if you choose to break his commandments and worship other things, in other words, put something above God and love something more, and whether if it's your job, your sport, your family, your friends, or your anything, your life, just living here on earth, if that's more important to you, then God considers you hate him. There's only two options here. Either you love God or you love the world. Those are the options. There's not a third option. So which is it? Do you love God or do you love the world? Do you love your life or do you love the world? Or do you love God? So it's so important that you understand this is how you love your first, you, you back to your first love, is you keep the commandments of God. And this is the very first thing God taught us 12 years ago. He said we need to keep the commandments of God. And so that's why every week we teach it somehow. But today, God wanted you to know this clearly of what's separating you from the other 500 million Christians, people that call themselves believers out there. What's, sep what's the separator is you love God. And how you love God is by keeping his commandments. 
Let's keep reading. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord your God will not hold anyone guiltless for misusing his name. This is another way that people are, you know, losing their first love is they're misusing his name. How do you misuse Jesus' name? You teach false doctrine. That's one of the ways to misuse his name. Teach false doctrine. Teach something that's not in the scriptures. Teach that the, the Ten Commandments are nailed to a cross. Teach that. Guess what? You're misusing his name. Because Jesus don't teach that. There ain't nowhere in the scriptures Jesus says the Ten Commandments are nailed to a cross. Nowhere. You know, teach that you don't keep the, have to keep the Sabbath day holy. That's, that's teaching a different Jesus. That's misusing Jesus' name. If you come over and you teach, if you teach that, that you know, uh, you don't need to be baptized. You can just say a sinner's prayer, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're saved. That's a different Jesus. That's misusing Jesus' name. Or, you know, just cursing in his name. Doing things like that. Guess what? That's misusing his name. So you don't want to misuse his name. He's not going to hold anyone guiltless who does that. Look at the third one, or the fourth one. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So how do we remember it? By keeping it holy. So that's the big thing you want to understand. So one of the ways we get back to our first love is we keep the Sabbath day holy. Now what does it mean to keep something holy? Well, you keep it holy by honoring it. By, by wanting to be there in your heart. By, by, this should be the most exciting day of the year. Imagine if every single week Jesus sat down with you and blessed you with your gifts. Blessed you with talents. Talked to you. Had a relationship with you. Gave you, you know, good gifts. Just, just did awesome things for you every Sabbath. Wouldn't you be excited every Sabbath to come and spend time with him? Yeah, of course you would. Well, that's exactly what he does. It just doesn't look like he wanted to. It doesn't look like he doesn't hand you money. He doesn't hand you a new car. He doesn't hand you fame and fortune. What he does is he gives you peace. He gives you joy. He gives you comfort. He, he, he lets you know what's going to happen. He, he talks to you. Gives you inspiration. Gives you inspiration for life. That's what it looks like. So that's why you honor it. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, Six days you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. Who? To the Lord. It's the Sabbath to the Lord. It's not your Sabbath. It's not my Sabbath. It's the Sabbath to the Lord. It says, On it do no, you should not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor your foreigners residing in your town. For six days the Lord made the heavens and earth and the sea that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So it's very important to understand that this, those first four are how we love God. It's how we get back to our loving God. And guess what? That's exactly what we're supposed to do. We need to start making that a point that you, you, you are grounded in those, four, in those areas. Because guess what we're going to be teaching for the next thousand years? How to love the Lord, your God. Because there's going to be people that are going to be left behind. And when we come back in spirit, see, we're going to be chained at the truth of an eye at the last trumpet. We're going to be chained. We're going to go to the kingdom of God. All heck's going to break loose on earth. There'll be wars and, room, the wars and stuff. People are going to die. There's going to be all kinds of craziness happening on earth. We're going to be in the kingdom of God. We're not going to see it. Because it's not going to be cameras looking down. We're not going to see all this you know, bad stuff that's happening. But it's going to happen. And then when we come back down and we reign after seven years, we're going to reign for a thousand years. And what we're going to be doing is rebuilding a new earth. God's making a new heaven with us. And then he's going to make a new earth. And we're going to be in spirit to be able to rebuild the earth. We're going to have new sporting events. We're going to have new sport, you know, schools. We're going to have a new school system, a new um, ecological system and a food system. Everything's going to be new, and we're going to be the ones doing it. We're going to be the ones making everything new. And most importantly, we're going to be teaching people the commandments of God and how it works. That's what we're doing right now. We're in training. But let me just tell you right now, Satan right now is trying to take you out. you got to understand Satan is trying to take you out. Now, he's not going to go after usually the strongest bull. Like, you know, I, I watch a lot of videos about animals and stuff, like in Africa and stuff. You can see, like, I was watching the tiger videos because, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a tiger. I love tigers. I get this tiger shirt on. But I was watching this video about tigers. The tigers are amazing hunters. But they hunt, you know, by themselves. They don't hunt like lions. Lions hunt in packs and they take an animal down in packs. Tigers are just some big monster animals. They get out there, swipe something down by themselves. They just take it out. Take, take out alligators and crocodiles. 
<laughs> Seriously, they go in the water, grab the crocodile, drag that sucker out, and eat it. Tigers are no joke, and I didn't realize that. But they they are no they don't play. But lions, what they do is they go and they hunt in packs. But I noticed one of the things about the lions when they go to hunt in packs and they see like the the big animals like the um, bison and stuff like that. Now they want one of these bison because you know one bison can feed about eight, you know eight ten you know tiger uh, lions for a while. They don't go after the big gigantic big bison with the big you know shoulders and the big horn. They don't go after that one. You know who they go after? The one lollygagging behind. The one doing his own thing over there, uh, over in the bush while all the big ones are over here. He wants to be over there by himself doing his own thing. Or the babies. That's the one they really go after, the baby um, bison or the baby, you know, big animal. The baby elephants even. The baby elephants because, you know, the mom and dad are over there feeding on the trees while the baby's over here wanting to play. And guess what the lions get? The babies. The children. You know why? Go after the children. They're easy prey. They don't know any different. Uh, they think it's okay to just go stray off alone and do your own thing. Well, guess who Satan is called? Satan is called a roaring lion. And Satan does the exact same thing. He's going after the kids. Satan is going after the kids. But he's also going after the adults. So let's read. Let's read a couple of scriptures on that. Let's go to Revelation. And you guys really want to pay attention to what I'm showing you right now. Revelation 2. Now you got to remember, we are Revelation 3. We're Revelation 3, which is the Church of Philadelphia. But we got to read Revelation 2 because it goes right along with it. Look what it says. To the angel of the Church of Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who hold the seven stars in his right hand. And the seven stars, by the way, are the seven angels in the seven churches, just so you know. And the golden lampstands. <clears throat> I know your deeds, you, um, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people. I want you guys to listen to this. Pay attention. It says, I know your deeds and you work hard in your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people that have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. So if that's you. So let's say you've been persevering. You've done hard work for the Lord. Um, but, and, but you've endured hardship. If that's you, then he's talking directly to you. And you haven't grown weary. In other words, you haven't quit. It says, yet I hold something against you. You have forsaken your first love. You had it first. So here's the real question you got to ask yourself in your own heart. And this is where it's time to really get real about yourself. Have you forsaken your first love. We now know what our first love needs to be. It needs to be God. In other words, pursuit of being with the Lord and loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we have that, that pursuit. In other words, we're doing everything for the Lord. God is in the center and our life fits around it. Have we lost our first love? Have you? Because God wants to check that and make sure that you, you get it back. It says you have forsaken your first love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. This is how you get back to your first love. Is you turn away. You turn away from what you're doing now and go back to your first love. It says, if you do not repent, now he's going to tell you the consequence if you choose not to. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Let me explain what that means. All the churches, right now you're part of the Church of Philadelphia. Each church is considered a lampstand. In other words, you're part of the Church of Philadelphia. Each one of those churches are considered lampstand. You can read about that in, in uh, Revelation 1. But he says he'll remove that lampstand from his place. In other words, you won't be part of the Church of Philadelphia. That's what the Bible says if you choose not to repent. So if you're right now not loving God as, as first and foremost, you're not putting him first, you're not getting back to your first love, he says he will remove it. And I'm telling you that, you better believe the scriptures. It says, but, if you have, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicodemians, which I also hate, which is deceitful practices and all kinds of things. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. Listen to where it is, which is in the paradise of God. In other words, you will make it as the first fruit. You see, this is the one thing I love about God and how he speaks to us so directly on the Sabbath. 
He's talking to us. He's talking to the people that should be the first fruit. Some of the first fruit that are listening right now, that might be watching this video, that may be watching this video on YouTube or on Facebook, some of you have a right to be first fruit right now. But some of you, because you're listening to the message, you might be turning your hearts and saying, oh, that's not true. I'm just going to go ahead and keep doing it. I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to change anything. You know what? When you're left behind, you're going to be looking back and saying, oh, my God. He was right. He did come remove my lampstand. I was right there. I knew the message. I, I watched the video years ago, and I'd recommend you guys to watch it. It's, it's an old movie called Left Behind. I watched that when I first got baptized. It's the first one, the very first movie called Left Behind. And I don't remember all the details of the movie. I do remember one part, though. Uh, when I first got baptized, I watched that movie, and I saw where this pastor, he was in front of the room, and everybody had already vanished. Now, this is not true, of course. There's a lot of deception in the movie. But the point is, everybody in this church disappeared. But he was still there, the pastor. And I remember he was standing there at the pulpit, nobody in the, in the congregation, because they'd all vanished already. And he was like, I can't believe it. You're all gone, and I'm still here. I knew this stuff. I taught it right from the pulpit, but I didn't believe it. And he fell on his knees and said, oh, God, oh, God. And he started crying. And I looked at that screen. I said, that ain't going to be me. I don't know what I got to do, but that guy ain't going to be me. I'm not going to be the one sitting there preaching the message, knowing the truth, having it being taught to me week after week, honoring the Sabbath with him in my living room, but I'm left behind and they're gone. I ain't going through that. And I hope you made a decision right now that you ain't going through that. I hope you take this message to heart and get back to your first love. The Lord is telling you. He's not telling Christians. You guys understand this. This message isn't for Christians. This message are for baptized disciples that are keeping the commandments of God, which is the first love. He's talking to the Church of Philadelphia right now. He's talking to the people that are becoming part of the Church of Philadelphia. He's talking to you. So you need to take this message to heart that this message is for you. Imagine no one else is watching this, and it's Jesus Christ sitting here in this seat. Now, I'm not Jesus Christ. I'm not even claiming to be that. I represent Jesus Christ, but I'm not Jesus Christ. You know, I'm a disciple just like you are. But here's the point. Imagine it was Jesus and he's talking directly to you. You need to say, this message is to me. It's not to anyone else. It's not a generic message. It's directly to you. You need to take this message to heart and say, am I back loving my first love? Am I back there? And if not, then you need to do exactly what the Bible says is repent and get back to your first love. Because Satan is trying to take you out. Now, how is he trying to take you out? Here's a few of the ways that he's trying to take us out, you guys. He's trying to make us worry. He's trying to make us worried about the things of this world. That's why watching the news is crazy right now. I don't watch it at all. I don't watch the internet, all that junk. You know, he's trying to get us worried about things like, um, things like the food, the food supply. Most people don't know that food supply, uh, most of the food supply chains around the world, especially in the United States, have been burned up. They've blown them up. They've gotten rid of them. So that means the food's going to start slowly but surely diminishing and it's not going to have any food. Kind of like what happened in Argentina a few years ago. I mean, where there'll be no more food. They're trying to ruin the economy. That's why they gave out all this free money to all these businesses and stuff. They gave all this free money so the dollar value would go down. See, the more money they give away for free, the less the money is worth. You understand? So, like, I'll give you an example. In, Arge in Argentina, some of those countries over there in, the, in, in South America... It will take about a million dollars to buy a loaf of bread. <laughs> Did you guys know that? Most people don't know that. It's literally, you'd have to have a stack of cash that much to go in and buy a candy bar. Yeah, so it's crazy. And that's what they're about to do here. They're trying to because they need to get rid of the cash so they can make a digital economy. You know, but people are worried about that. People are worried about their lifestyle. I want to get my lifestyle. You know, I live in a beautiful area here, but everybody's worried about their lifestyle. You know, they want their school to be the best, their college to be the best. They want their cars and their houses and this. And that. They just worry about their lifestyle. Everybody's just concerned about their future, their retirement program. Oh, I can't wait to retire. It's going to be so nice. And it's all I hear every day. I'm in training. I'm in sales training. And all I hear about is people worried about their retirement all the time. They're worried about war. They're worried about what's happening over in China. You know, China and, and Russia, and they're looking at bombing us, which is probably going to be happening real soon. Matter of fact, in New York, they just sent an announcement all to all the people that if a nuclear bomb goes off, we're to hide. In New York, they just sent that just the other day. 
So that's going to happen. They already know it. That's why they're warning people in advance. It ain't going to happen until the 144,000 are gone. But it's going to happen. That's why you don't want to be left behind during that time. So people are, tr are worried about all these different things. You know, another thing people are, are, are concerned about and what's happening and what's helping you lose your first love and how Satan's attacking you is he's keeping you busy. Busyness is one of the biggest ways for him to keep you um, from being, what the Bible says, write this down, ineffective and unproductive. The Bible says when you're busy doing other stuff, you're ineffective and unproductive. As a disciple of Jesus, we're supposed to be effective and productive. We're supposed to be doing the work of God, which is making a disciple, baptizing him and teaching to obey the commandments or planting seed. That's our job. Our bodies are not our own. We were bought at a price, just like we read in the scripture of the day. Our life is not our own as a disciple. When you made a decision to get, become a disciple of Jesus, your life is no longer your life no more. But Satan knows that. So what does he do? He keeps you busy. Let me give you the definition of the word busy. B-U-S-Y. Write this down, you guys. Write this down on your page. B-U-S-Y. It stands for being under Satan's yoke. You're under Satan's yoke. In other words, you're under his slavery again, just like they were in Africa, in Egypt. See, when you are under Satan's yoke, you're under his busyness. And he gets you busy at work. He gets you always wanting to work, 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 work. Never enough. No matter how much money you earn, you got to earn more. No matter how much, you know, how much, what, what you do, you got to do more. It's always more and more and more. That's why God told us to rest on the seventh day. So we can work six days and have the seventh day rest. But God, is, Satan is always trying to get you to do more, earn more, make more. Because you got to be bigger and better. It was interesting today when I went to the school. I went to Maddox's school today. And it was such a nice school, really beautiful school over there. I'm so excited for him. But you know what I felt like when I got there? I'm going to tell you how I felt. And I'm pretty, you know, I'm out and, you know, I go to the gym and I don't do a lot right now because there's not a lot to do around here. Or there's a lot to do around here, but I'm just not doing a lot. But anyway, when I went there today, it was interesting. You know how I felt? I felt super insignificant. That's what I felt. I felt like a pea in a, in a field of corn. Like all this corn, I felt like a little pea, just like nothing, insignificant. Now I know, you know, God has blessed me and, and I believe I'm probably one of the most influential in, 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 in people on earth right now as far as what I'm doing for God. But when I got out in the world, I felt insignificant because you got this big old world and all these people in school and kids and running around and doing all this. And then I drive into my neighborhood and people are watering the lawn and walking the dog and all these beautiful houses. And I just think, I'm thinking, man, in the grand scheme of things in this world, you know, that's why everybody's trying to get a bigger car, a better house, a new this, a new that, and, and a bigger lifestyle and a bigger retirement. They want to travel and do all this stuff. You know why? Because they're trying to find significance in their life. They're trying to find what, what makes them significant, what makes them different. That's why people got to be the richest or the best or the fastest or the strongest or the most successful so they can find significance. And you know what? I came home and I was like, wow, God, thank you so much. You know why? Because all of this is meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. I have the most significant thing on earth. I'm making disciples. <laughs> you know, my job is to make disciples. Yesterday, I was doing a coaching call with one of my clients. She's a lady um, named Donna. And... You know, uh, she's actually one of my coaching clients who lives in Canada. And she said something to me that I could say was the most inspirational thing that I've ever had anybody say to me personally. And it wasn't warranted. So let me explain. And it wasn't true either. But this is what she said. I, you know, I got on a Zoom with her. And, you know, we were talking about her, her website and talking stuff that, stuff that we needed to get done. She goes, Stephen, um, you know, I want to talk to you about something because, you know, I believe that you are the closest person I, I, I've ever met you're, you're to, to God, as God, for, for me. You're the closest person I've ever met to God. And I said, wow, wow. She's, she's like 65 or 70 years old, somewhere on there. And I was like, wow. She, so she was asking me some questions about her business. She had been watching our Saved by Truth website. She'd been doing all that. She'd been watching our videos. And she had a friend that, you know, you know, understood the Sabbath, so she started talking about the Sabbath, and she's now studying the Bible with Jamie on Monday. 
But when she said that, she goes, you're the most, you're the closest person that I have ever met to, to God. And I was like, wow. And I said, well, just let me just tell you right up front. She goes, I don't want you to take this wrong. And I said, no, you don't know understand. I don't take it wrong, but I'm going to tell you right up front. I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> just want to let you know that. Just understand. But I appreciate that. That was so impacting to me. Because from her perspective, she hears God's voice when I speak to her. And you know, the Bible says that what's supposed to happen. It says when you speak to people, they're supposed to be hearing Jesus. Here's the question. When you speak to people, do people hear Jesus or do people hear Satan? The Bible says when they, when the Bible actually says when you're speaking, they're supposed to hear the voice of God because the, what, the word that you're speaking, you're speaking about godly things that's leading them to Jesus. And then that's leading them to the Father. Just like Jesus came to lead people to the Father. Guess what disciples are here to do? Lead people to Jesus. That leads people to the Father. So when you speak, when the words that come out of your mouth, what comes out of your heart to people that you don't know, do they see Jesus through you? Because that's what's supposed to happen. So it's very important to understand this. And this is one of the things, this is how Satan is deceiving us and getting us busy, is that our work. You know, that we're so focused on money or focused on success or focused on something else that we're not focused on that. What about fun? Is fun taking you out? Is, is that one of the ways Satan is taking you out? Is that all that's important to you is fun? Or how about school? You know, I'm talking to some people that are in school that might be people in college right now. Is that, is that something that's taking you out? How about relationships? Are you so focused on your relationship with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse, your, your significant other, whatever the case may be, and you're so focused on that, but you're not focused on the mission, which is making disciples. Are you so focused on your relationship? What about entertainment itself? Just entertainment, watching TV, watching sports, watching your cell phone, watching, you know, all that stuff. Is that what's taking you out? Because Satan's going to get you busy doing something. Because if he can get you busy doing those things, guess what you're not doing? You're not making disciples. You're not letting your light shine. You're not planting the seed. You're ineffective and unproductive. And that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Now, I saw a video yesterday. I sent it out to a few of you. And I think that's why God wanted me to teach this message today. Because I watched a video from Beyonce. Now, Beyonce was a Christian girl when she was young. Her family grew up in a Christian household. But this lady now has married JC. And if you guys know JC, he is a very demonic guy. He, he believes in the whole New World Order stuff. But Beyonce sent um, her new album. She's been shown on four different horses. A black horse, a pale horse now, this was today, a red horse, and I think it's, a, I can't remember the other color of the horse. But there's four horses in the book of Revelation. She's been shown on all four horses. Well, this last horse is the horse of, I think it's the one of death and stuff that's coming, but it's the pale horse. And she pretty much has almost no clothes on, on this horse. But this, this pastor did a video on Facebook. And he was talking about Beyonce and the lyrics in this song. Now, you guys got to understand, I grew up in the area of NWA. I grew up in the era of Snoop Dogg and, and you know, all the gangster rap. I grew up in the era of a lot of the, that type of music. And nowadays, the music, you know, the Nicki, whatever her name is, and all the Adriana Grande or whatever their names are, all these people, and Lady Gaga and all these people, I have never heard of an artist that has put together a collection of songs more demonic, more cursing, more profanity, and more vulgar language than what Beyonce just put on this last album. It is unbelievable how she's trying to get the entire gay agenda to all the kids. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, this pastor went through the lyrics in this song. He just broke down the lyrics, showed the lyrics. And I just... I sent it to a few of you. I sent it to my daughter, I sent it to my wife, and I should almost shouldn't have sent it. It was that profane. I, I can't even, I wouldn't even show it to you right now. The, the lyrics are so bad. And that just, album just hit just recently, and it's one of the tops on the charts. So they have sent the demons at full force to go around the world to infect the kids and, and the adults alike. 
and she has a giant following. Now, she did a message in a church. A church pastor allowed her to come in and start a church a couple years ago. And I can tell you, I've never heard a song with more demonic words than that. So I just want you guys to understand, Satan is right now trying to take our kids out. He's going after the young He's going after the young, simple mind, the ones that think they, they know everything, the teenagers especially, that think they got it all together and they know, all, they know how to protect themselves. Nope, that's that little, that little um, bison over off by himself. Satan is going after them in full force. Kind of like countering the conspiracy to destroy black boys. If you destroy them as a boy, they'll never become a man. So that's exactly what Satan's doing right now. Another way Satan is trying to take you out is through sin. Let's look at first Timothy. So you got to know what the, the problem is first before you can do anything about it. First Timothy 3. I think it's first Timothy 3. Or no, it's second Timothy 3. I apologize. Second Timothy 3. Yep. Second Timothy 3, starting in verse 1. It says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days, which is right now. And here's what terrible times look like. People will be lovers of themselves. This is the first time in the history of mankind. From 2009, when the crash happened, happened to be when Obama was, till now, something that happened that has never been in existence in the history of mankind. Something from 2009 till now. What happened in 2009? The iPhone was created. You know, with the big screen, the iPhone. After that, all these other phones followed. They're called smartphones. Never in the history of mankind would a human being take their cell phone, turn it around on themselves, and take pictures. Never in the history of mankind. So we've been around for 6,000 years. But in the last 12 years, this one phenomenon of taking pictures of themselves. People have more pictures of themselves on their phone than they have of anyone or anything else. You know why? Because they're lovers of themselves. Never in the history of mankind. Now you got to understand, mankind's been around 6,000 years. But in the last 12 years, 13 years, the one thing that God says that's going to determine when we're in the end times is the one thing that's more prevalent than anything else. Every social media is based on you taking pictures of yourself or shooting video of yourself or doing small, short, real videos. Everyone, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, they're, they're paying out millions of dollars to people that shoot 30 second reels on Facebook right now and on TikTok. That means 30 seconds of you teaching something, 30 seconds of you shooting a video, 30 seconds of you playing basketball, 30 seconds of you doing something that you love doing, and it's just you, you, you. It's me, 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 me. Just me, just me. I'm just smiling. Ooh, just, ooh. At the, I'm, I'm at the gym. This guy is at the gym and girls at the gym. Just taking photos of themselves, standing in the mirror, taking photos and posting. And, and got the got the stand, got, got tripods at the gym. Tripods with their phone up there while they're doing squats and lifting weights. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? I'm looking around. Now I'm working out like a madman. But everybody else got their camera posted up, taking pictures of themselves. That's how we know we're in the last days. This has never happened in the history of mankind. When peoples are lovers of themselves. So if you're a lover of yourself, guess what you're not a lover of? God. See, you became the idol. You have put yourself over God now. You have more pictures of God, of, of you, than you have pictures of, any, of nature, of anything. People used to take pictures of flowers, of houses, of cars, of this, of that. People used to take pictures of other stuff, not of themselves. Could you, do you understand how ridiculous that is? I, mean, I can't imagine in high school. I used to walk around with a camera in high school. I had a camera everywhere I went in high school. But guess what I took pictures of? The girls. Now, you might give me a picture in the, with me with the girl, or a picture of me playing sports, or a picture of us on football, pictures of my friends. I wasn't taking a picture of me. I never would stand there and turn my camera around my Polaroid, that's what we had back then, my Polaroid, and take a picture of myself. That would feel like the biggest goofball in the world. But now it's the norm. 
And that is the number one thing he tells us to determine whether we are in the last days and what makes it terrible times. So if that's you, you need to repent and stop taking pictures of yourself and stop focusing on you and stop thinking about you, 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 you. The world doesn't revolve around you. It says lovers of money is the second thing. Now, if you notice, this is kind of in an order. So love of money is less than the lover of yourself. Do you see that? In other words, greed, wanting to get rich, running to get wealth, wanting to have your future and buy new cars and fancy houses and all this stuff, that's less of a threat to your salvation than the lover of yourself. <laughs> you get that? This is how bad all these pictures of yourself and selfies and all this social media and all this garbage is. That's worse than the lover of money, which the Bible calls as idolatry and greed. Guess what taking pictures of yourself is called? Idolatry. You're idolizing yourself. You became the idol. Kind of like the TV show back in the day, American Idol. You're the American Idol now. Look what it says, being proud, being prideful. In other words, knowing everything, not paying attention, not listening to your parents, not listening to your friends, not listening to that sound advice. Abusive, disobedient to their parents. Right there, it says it right there. Ungrateful. Not being grateful for what you have. This is how Satan's trying to take you out. You can live in the nicest area, have the most beautiful you know, environment, live, have everything you need, but still be ungrateful. Where we see brothers in Africa, we see this lady over there getting some free toilet paper that Daniel's given her, some free stuff, and she's just so grateful that she can now eat something today. The brothers over there in Africa, you know what they would like to have? Some clean water one day. They like to have clean water. You know what they really like to have? A nice pair of shoes. I was so encouraged because Daniel the other day, Daniel's car got, you know, they, they kind of got, get, took his car from his truck and they flattened his tires and blew all his tires out. He went to jail or, or I think they went to jail. They took him and then he had to get out and get, his, get out of jail and get his, or I think he went to jail, but they took his car and pounded his car. He had to get his car out. So I was so encouraged by the brothers that donated and gave because we were able to get his car out and get his tires fixed. You know what he said? He, I said, how much is it going to cost to get your tires fixed? He said, I don't know. I've never had a car before. <laughs> I'm like, wow. He didn't even know how much it costs to get his tires fixed. He's never had a car. But I have, my kids have had two, three cars. And they're not grateful for the car they have now. You know, or some of us, some kids, I'm not just talking about my kids. I'm just talking about yeah. kids in general. Kids where I live, they have a Mercedes. They have a, a you know, or they have this and they have that. And they're just not even grateful for what they have. And we have brothers in our, in our ministry that are just grateful to have a meal today. You know, that's why I'm willing to give them everything. I give everything I have. Anything extra, you know, if I can give, I do. Because they're grateful. But see, the people here in America, they're ungrateful. That's why America will be destroyed. They're unholy. There's no holiness in their life. That's one of the things that Satan is doing. He's taking the people out. There's no holiness. They're without love. In other words, they have a hard heart. They're not loving to people. They're mean and disrespectful to people. They're unforgiving. In other words, they hold bitterness in their heart. They don't forgive. The Bible says if you don't forgive your people when they sin against you, the Heavenly Father will not forgive you. Your sin. They slander us. They talk bad about people. They bag on each other. They're without self-control. In other words, they're just out doing whatever they want to do because they have no self-control. They're brutal. You see the brutal killings, the people that, stuff that's happening around the world today, it's unbelievable. I mean, some of the, I don't even want to talk about some of the things I've seen just recently of how brutal people are. People don't just kill people by accident anymore. They come up with creative ways to do it nowadays. They're not lovers of the good. They're treacherous, rash, conceited, Here's the big one, lovers of pleasure, rather lovers of God. And here's the one that God wants you to see. That affects us individually as believers, as disciples, and as people that say they're disciples. Having a form of godliness, but denying his power. In other words, you might go to church, you might honor the Sabbath, you might be there, but, but you deny the power of God. You don't really put your faith in him. You don't really even test his faith by doing faith goals. 
You don't even have faith. You don't even study out the meaning of faith. You may not even know the definition of faith. Because you have a form of godliness, but you deny his power. Look what the Bible tells us to do with those people. Have nothing to do with them. He's not talking to non-believers. He's talking to you. So this is why you need to take this message to heart. If any of these are in your life, you need to repent. I'd strongly recommend to write down each one of those words. If you don't know the definition of it, go look it up in the dictionary. And repent. Make a decision to turn the other way. It says, these are those who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. Who are loaded down with sin and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to the coming to the knowledge of the truth. That's another thing that's happening right now. All these people are learning, knowledge, 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 learning all this stuff. But they never get to the truth. Just like Janus and Jambus opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. That's what I deal with on a daily basis. I deal with all these pastors and people out there that are, that are deceived, especially in the U.S. Overseas, I don't get it as much. But in the United States, I get so many pastors that come to me wanting to tell me that baptism isn't for forgiveness of sin or that the commandments are nailed to a cross. So many times, that's the big argument, or you don't have to honor the Sabbath day. They are men with depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned, look what it says, are rejected. They're rejected. But they would not get far, because in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. So you got to understand, this is what's happening, you guys. This is the end times. And so this is an encouraging message if you're right with God. It's also an encouraging message if you're not. If you have some of those sins in your life, at least he's telling you what to do. He's telling you to how to, that you need to repent. You need to get back to your first love. So he's not telling you this because he's mad at you. See, punishment from, from your parents is not a bad thing. It's designed to get you back on track. Because if they see you going off track and you get in punishment, it's to put you back on track. It's not, to, it's not because they hate you or they're mad at you. That's why the Bible says in, in Hebrews 12, it says discipline from your father is a good thing. It's a blessing. That means they love you. See, it's much easier if we don't care. If I don't care about you, let you just go run amok and do drugs and do stupid stuff, that means we don't care. No, a loving parent provides and, and punishes and disciplines their kids. And so God's just disciplining you right now that he knows that in the body of Christ, this type of stuff is running rampant. So if that's the case, he's doing this for you, not to you. Write that down. God never does anything to you. He does it for you. And I can absolutely say, and my wife will attest, that's probably one of my biggest strengths is no matter what I go through. My face was half deformed and I had, couldn't even speak. And I had to get up and speak and do business because I had Bell's palsy. I got sick and was in the hospital with pneumonia nine times. I almost died. My kidneys almost failed. My lungs almost failed. I had so many different things going on in my life. Never once, ever did I blame God. I said, thank you for allowing that to happen to me because he did it for me and not to me. You have no idea. God doesn't do anything to you. He does it for your good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I want you to start dealing with that mindset. Satan wants you to believe that he's doing it to you. He's not doing it to you. You make your own choices. He gives you free will, but he's going to punish you and get you back on track. And that's what he's doing with this message. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance. See, you can tell who he's talking to. He's talking directly to you. He says, you know the teaching. And you know the way of life of a disciple. You know what his purpose is to make disciples and get all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know the faith that we're supposed to have. You know the patience and the love for people we're supposed to have and that we need to endure to the end. He says you know it. So he's talking directly to you. Persecutions and sufferings. What kind of things happened to me at Antioch? Iconium, Lytra, the persecution I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, every, listen to what it says, you guys. Listen to what it says. Every, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Everyone. <clears throat> if you want to repent and really live a godly life right now, if you want to do that, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be challenged. It says, 
While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Here it is. But as for you, continue what you have learned and been con become convinced of because you know of from whom you learned it. So he wants you to remember what you've learned. Remember the commandments. Remember the faith that you've heard. It says, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which you are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So you got to remember, that's why it's so important for you guys now to start diving into your scriptures, diving into back into the covenant and doing the work of God. This is what's going to help Satan stay at bay. Satan won't mess with strong disciples. Satan messes with weak disciples. He tries to tempt strong disciples, but we know how to fight that off of scripture. We know how to get back and say, get, get away from me, Satan. I, I, don't, I don't play that. No, nope. It ain't going out like that. We know how to fight that. But weak baby disciples don't. That's why he's trying to teach you what to do. Here's another way that you can fight Satan right here. Here's another one. Let's go to, here's how you remain in your first love. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, start at verse 34. Matthew 22, verse 34 says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and Pharisees, got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So how do we get back to our first love? We love the Lord your God. Now, how do we do that? We went through the first four. We love, our God. We love the Lord your God. We do not put any other gods before us. We you know, don't have any idols in our life. And we don't teach false doctrine. And we, we don't put the name, Lord's name in vain. That's how we love the Lord our God. <clears throat> the first commandment, oh, and we keep the Sabbath day holy. That's how we love the Lord your God. And then it says, and the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how do we love our neighbors? We do the other five commandments. You know, we do not lie. We do not steal. We do not covet. We do not want and desire the things of this world. See, those two are what the commandments are. And it says all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. That's right. That's why we teach the commandments, you guys. That is why. And this is how we get back to our first love. See, the Lord's calling you this because he's purifying you. I've been telling you that for the last few weeks. He's purifying you for a reason. He's trying to make a pure bride spotless and blameless, just like it says in Revelation 14. But you have to do part of the work. He can only teach you the message. You have to do the work to purify yourself. Here's another way that we can fight off Satan. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew 6, Matthew 6, start at verse 25. Matthew 6, actually starting at verse 1. I apologize. Matthew 6, starting at verse 1. Title of this is Give to the Needy. That's interesting. It says, be careful. Do not practice your righteousness in front of others. Actually, that's not where I was supposed to go. I apologize. Matthew 6, starting at verse 19. Here it is. Matthew 6, starting at verse 19. It says, Do not store up for yourselves <clears throat> treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, or rust is another word for it, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So what the God's is telling you how to get back to your first love. You know what you do? You do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. You store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What is the only thing you can take to heaven? Other people. Yourself and your hearers. That's it. You can't take your money. You can't take your car. You can't take your school. You can't take anything. You can take yourself and the people around you, your friends and family. So what should your call to the hour should be right now? How can I make impact with the people around me? How can I lead someone to a Bible study? How can I lead someone to repent from their sin? How can I lead someone to, to know more about Jesus? 
How can I lead someone to get their sins forgiven and get baptized for the forgiveness of their sin and be the first fruit? How can I lead someone there? Because that's the only thing you can take to heaven. Nothing else. And either you believe Jesus is coming soon or you don't. But you better believe it because it's going to happen. We've been doing this 12 years. Are we closer or further away? Of course we're closer. We can see the signs. It's easy to see. So we need to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And that's what our intent is on our ministry, is to store up treasures in heaven. We have one goal right now. All these 500-something um, pastors and evangelists and, and minister leaders, we got one goal, to find as many people that want to be the first fruit as possible. Because we don't know how many are left. And then our second goal is to plant seeds so that when the angels come back, the angels will teach the people that have got left behind so they'll repent and they can be what's called the great harvest. You can read about that in Revelation 14. Verses 1 through 5 is the first fruit. And Revelation 14 verses 6 through 14 is the great harvest. Those are the people that have to die for their faith that are left behind. So you got to understand that is our plan right now is to help find 144,000. But you need to be thinking about this for yourself. Do I have one friend I can share? One. One friend that I can teach about the commandments. One friend that I can tell them about baptism. One friend that I can tell them to repent from whatever sins that they're in. One. Because that's what you should be doing right now. Storing up treasures in heaven. It says the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What does that mean? Be protect what you're looking at. Are you looking at your phone and you're looking at negative and bad stuff on your phone? Are you watching bad negative videos? Are you watching bad negative movies that are impacting your subconscious, especially children? What are you looking at on your phone? Are you looking at sin? Are you looking at sin on your computer? If that's the case, you need to repent. You need to change your eyes. Because if you're putting all that in, bad negative, then that negative is coming out. How could you possibly go lead someone to God if all you're doing all day long is looking at negative and bad and, and perverted stuff? How? You can't. You know, you got to clean out the cup. You got to repent. You got to get all that garbage out of your life. Keep your eyes focused on the prize. Here's why. Look what it says. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. So that's why. See, if you love this world, if you love the things of this world, if you love the, the pleasures of life, if you love yourself by all these selfies and taking pictures of you, if that's the most important prevalent thing, you're going to despise, despise God. You won't want to read the Bible. You won't want to go to the Sabbath day. You won't want to honor the Lord. You ain't going to want to do that because you know what's most important? It's loving yourself. Or, it says loving money. See, remember the two things that were the most prevalent? Uh, loving yourself, the, the loving of themselves. And lovers of money. Those are the two things. Well, this one's talking about money now. So, But they both apply. So you can't serve both God and money. You can't serve God and yourself either. We need to get back to our first love, which is loving the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our spirit. That needs to be the heart right now. And if that's not you, you need to repent. Another thing we need to do to, to fight Satan, because this is how Satan is trying to take us out, you guys. We talked about worry. Go to Matthew 6. Actually, I think we're already at Matthew 6, right? So let's just scroll down a little further. Matthew 6, go down to 25. Here's another way Satan is trying to take you out. Trying to get you to worry about stuff. But the Bible says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. About what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Or your body or what you'll wear. In other words, the fancy clothes that you might want to buy. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? No, I want to talk about this. This is important. See, right now people are worried, especially right here where I live in different areas in California, different places where I've lived over the years. People are just worried about all their stuff. They want to get a nicer car, better clothes, and nicer hairdo, and nicer this, and it's just stuff. You know what I have? I got a closet full of workout clothes. <laughs> That's it. I got a couple outfits. Most of them don't fit. I put on a pair of shorts today to go to Maddox's school. I put these shorts on. I literally probably could have fit Maddox in my pants, my shorts, at the same time. That's how big my shorts were over myself. I have lost so much body fat and so much weight. I literally had that much room in my pants in the front. That much. Like six inches, seven inches. 
it was crazy. My, I had to buckle. It was, it was weird. I had to fold them around just to get a, a buckle up. It was crazy. It looked crazy. But you know what? That's awesome. You know why I got this? I work it out and get back in shape. But you know what? I don't worry about clothes. I got I got workout outfits. That's it. I got a couple outfits in my closet. I'm not worried about my clothes. I used to. I used to be a fashion designer. When I was in high school, I had 70 pairs of pants. I used to make clothes every day in, in high school. Now, I don't worry about that. I don't worry about what I eat. You know what I eat? I have shakes in my closet. I bought a whole box of shakes from online that I drink every day. I drink a shake. I drink a protein shake. I eat some asparagus. I eat salmon. And I eat nuts. Of almonds and I eat session nuts. That's pretty much my whole meals almost every day. I don't worry about what I eat. If everything goes to pot, it doesn't matter. I'll just go fish. <laughs> I'll grab some fish. And I'm good. I don't worry about what I eat. And just like the brothers in Africa, they're not worried about what they eat. God provides for them. So important that we're not just worried about all this stuff. Going to get the best steak and lobster and, you know, just spending money like crazy. It says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable than they? Can anyone by worrying at a single hour of their life? So that's why I don't worry. I, I live a really a pretty stress-free life. I go to the gym, I work out, I come home, I do the, the stuff with the ministry, I do my best to try to spend time with the family, I try to do different things, but I don't I have zero stress. Our bills are paid every month, we get a little extra, we have some fun. I don't I have zero stress. I'm not worried. Um, I don't know what my credit score is, none of that, none of the stuff in this world. I own no houses, I own no cars. I own nothing. I own no, no investments. I own no, no big nothing. I own a laptop. That's, that's what I own. A laptop with some cameras. That's what I got. And that's it. And you know what? I'm okay. You know why? Because when the Lord comes, guess how much of it I'm going to be able to take with me? <laughs> None. None. So it doesn't matter. It says, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he much, much more clothe you, or you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Look what it says, for the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them. But here's the key. Here's how you get back to your first love. Here's how you do it. But seek first the kingdom. In other words, seek first being in the kingdom of God. That is the number one way you do it. If you notice, all this whole theme has just been seek first again. What should we be thinking about is being in the kingdom of God. See, we talk about technology. We got these phones and we got all this technology. Who do you think brought all this technology down to earth? The demon angels that's come down to earth. The angels came and brought this technology. You don't think we're going to have better technology in the kingdom of God than we have here? Or in the new heaven, new earth that we have here? Think about all the technology we have. We have quantum physics. We have computers. We have laptops. We have internet. We have all this technology on earth. What do you think is going to happen? We're going to go to the kingdom of God, be in heaven, and then be back playing around with sticks and stones and rocks? Is that what you think we're going to do? We're going to go back to the primitive age, right? So in the kingdom of God where it's glorious, where no eye has seen, no mind can conceive what God has in store for us, the technology and the knowledge and the, the, the infrastructure of there... Is like it was when we were in the Stone Age. Is that what you're thinking? No, of course not. The technology there is a hundred thousand times better than what it is here. They're bringing it here. See, what people don't know is this: when the when the angels fell years ago in the days of Noah before the flood, you know the reason for the flood because the angels came down and they brought technology. They brought war. They brought weapons. They brought jewelry, they brought makeup, and they brought technology, they brought magic arts. They brought all this stuff down and taught it to the people which they weren't supposed to do. They taught how to mix genes, how to mix animal with man, how to mix you know, different species together. They taught all that stuff and it corrupted the blood flow. So if the angels back then, that was 5,000 years ago, taught the people back then all that technology, what do you think is happening right now? How do you think we had such a technology boom in the last 100 years? So we go 6,000 or oh, 5,999 years or 900 years and with, with, you know, doing horse and buggy. And then all of a sudden in the last 100 years, boom, this technology boom. And in the last 10 years, it's even worse. How do you think that happened? Because the Bible says in the last days, the angels are going to come down. 
and they're going to come back again and they're going to do the same thing. And they brought this technology. So if the technology right now here on earth is so outstanding and so fantastic and so magnificent and so awesome, what's it going to be like in the kingdom of God? Well, I know what it's going to be like because God has showed me. God has showed me what sonar looks like. He showed me. He put in my head all of my ministry songs, including the songs after. And he did it with no wires, no technology. He put it right in my head. I reiterated. I said it last feast. And he pulled up a YouTube video of a karaoke of each one of those songs. That was no accident. That was technology that God has that no one has. That's called telepathy. That's called tele telepathic. The way we communicate in the kingdom of God is like nothing you can imagine. These cell phones are primitive talk, primitive stuff compared to what's in the kingdom of God. That's why the God, God wants you to look up. He wants you to be seeking first the kingdom of God. The stuff that you have here, the technology we have here, what do we, you think we're going to be doing? Just sitting around on rocks, singing to God all day? That's what we're going to be doing? No, we're going to have a heavenly body. Like Jesus, we're going to be able to walk through walls. We're going to be able to go from there and back, just like angels do. Angels come back and forth. We're going to have the ability to come back and forth. Angels can trans form themselves into different people or into different things, different even into a river. There was a scripture in, in the book of Joshua where, where, the, uh, where um, the, uh, an angel came down, or a demon came down actually, an angel, you know, basically Satan, transformed himself into a river so that Abraham would not go up to the mountain and sacrifice Isaac. Most people don't know that. So you got to understand, we're going to have the ability to transform. Why do you think God wants us to seek first the kingdom? He says, we have no idea what we have in store for us. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind can conceive of what he has in store for us. And I got a very vivid imagination. But you can't even conceive of it. In other words, you can't even comprehend what he has in store for us. It can't even come into your psyche if it's that good. Why do you think he's so excited for you to be there? But are you excited to be there? Or do you want to stay here? This world is done. And God is waiting patiently for you to be excited to be there and for us to get this message to the 144,000 so we can take his 144,000 to be with him. He can't wait to give you these good gifts. And that's why we shouldn't be worried about anything. That's why we need to get back to our first love. Because we should be seeking first the kingdom. And the second thing is like it. And righteousness. You know what righteousness means biblically? Keeping the commandments of God. That's what we should be doing. That should be our number one focus priority. It says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will have a worry about itself. Each day has a noble trouble of its own. That's what we should be doing. That should be your primary concern right now. Let's look. We need to release the yoke of slavery, you guys. Let's go over to 1 Timothy. First Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, starting at verse 1. Look what it says. Why don't you write this scripture down? First 6, 1 Timothy 6, verse 1, it says, All who are under the yoke of slavery, remember I said you're under Satan's yoke? Being under Satan's yoke is being busy. This He's talking to you. Should consider their masters worthy of respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. Let me translate that. Because slaves mean people that work with them. That's what they used to call them back days. They don't call them employees in the scripture. They call them slaves. But see, he's talking about you should be honoring the people that are, are out there on the front line and that are preaching the message and, and taking care of the people because they care about you. Look at what it says. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with sound instructions of our Lord Jesus Christ and the godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. So this is the basic principle for all of you that are teaching this message. 
You need to understand, if people, you start teaching people about the commandments, you start teaching about baptism, you start teaching about how the Sabbath day works, and they don't want to hear it because they want to teach you all these stupid things, you get off the phone with them. You're you done, done talking to them because they don't want to hear it. They're conceited and they understand nothing. I had a conversation the other day. I had two of them. A pastor linked up on me on Facebook and said, hey, I want to talk to you. I said, yeah, no problem. What's going on? He goes, yeah, I want to talk to you about baptism. I said, great, no problem. Call me up. So he called me up. So we're talking. He goes, yeah, I want to understand your thought, thoughts about baptism. So I started showing him the scriptures. He was like, yeah, but the water doesn't mean water. It means water of, of childbirth. And it sounds like, well, Jesus was born and baptized in water. What are you talking about? And so we started going through it. And he just started arguing the scriptures, arguing the scriptures, arguing the scriptures. I just said to him, I said, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it to you. Let's say you're right. Let's say all you have to do is believe in Jesus. You don't have to be baptized, right? If that's the case, you're right. And I'm right. That means I'm going to the kingdom of God and so are you. But if what I'm showing you is right, you're wrong. And you're going to be left behind. So let me ask you a question. Have you been baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins according to Acts 2.38? He says, no. I said, well, when did you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? He said, well, when I said this prayer and such and such, I said, okay, well, let me just be blunt. Um, you're not, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You, you probably do not, uh, you're not part of the body of Christ. You probably are not um, going to enter the kingdom of God. You will be left behind and you will go through the hour of trial. And so I said, okay, well, if that's the case, and he, and he goes, what are you talking about? He started getting mad at me, yelling at me. I said, okay, well, I just want to let you know that's, the, that's what's going to happen. So I sent you the information. I got to go because I'm going to the gym now. I pray for you. He was starting to yell at me and scream. And I said, listen, I don't have time to talk about this. I just gave you the information. I, I'll pray for you. You have a blessed day. And I hung up and I went to the gym and worked out. I have no time to argue with people that don't want to hear sound doctrine. Because the angels come teach it to them later. See, look what it says. It says they are, verse 4, it says they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of crook mind who rob the truth, who are robbed of the truth, and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. So you got to understand, you don't have these debates with people. You shared the message, the people that want to hear it, amen. They have ears to hear, eyes to see, and Jesus is calling them. They're the, they're the you know, Jesus is sheep. And the ones that don't want to hear it, you, you just let them go. Let's keep reading. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And this is what you guys should be striving for right now, to be content. Have the urgency to go and you know help your friends and your family and your people that you love and you care have an urgency but be content with what you have see contentment is great gain i can say that's one of the secrets that i learned years ago is the secret to contentment i could be dead broke and not have a dollar in my pocket i could have millions of dollars and you wouldn't even know it as a matter of fact in 2017 uh, when we start, first started this message or 2018 one of the two um i had prayed god i want to get this message all around the world so out of the blue, a lady called me from business and said, Stephen, I want to send you to Thailand. I said, to Thailand? Okay, I've never been to Thailand. She says, yeah, we're having a business meeting over there. It's a business training at my, at my business university. There's going to be hundreds of people there, millionaires, billionaires, and, and also all these uh, business professionals from all around the world. I want you to go to Thailand. I was like, okay. I said, he goes, you, you know, you're going to have to fly over there. And I said, we'll pay for your hotel, pay for all your food. You, you just have to get there. And I said, well, unfortunately, you know, because it was just after the Feast of Tabernacles, I already donated all of our money. So I had zero money at that moment. I said, well, you know, I would love to go, but unfortunately, I don't have money to buy an airline ticket. So I can't, I can't spend $1,500 on an airline ticket. So she goes, hold on one second. I'll call you back. So she called me back. She goes, okay, we bought your ticket for you. Can you go now? I was like, uh, yeah, I'll go. No problem. I said, what do you want me to teach? She goes, I want you to teach, you know, what you teach. You teach sales training. You're going to be the only sales trainer in the room. So I want you to teach your message. And I said, okay, no problem. I'll do that. I created a PowerPoint. The first 15 minutes in the PowerPoint was my message about the kingdom of God, about our ministry. And I told my story and all that stuff. Had all message about God and about Jesus. Now, you got to understand, Thailand is a Buddhist country. I was the only Hebrew in the room. Everybody else was European or something else. Asians, millionaires, billionaires, and, and people from other countries around the world. I'm the only Hebrew in the room, and I'm the only one teaching about God in the room because it's a Buddhist country. Okay? So I'm now I'm on the stage, and I teach this message. And when I got there, it was, it was amazing because I teach this message. 
I got a standing ovation, got, you know, 100% pretty much except one person didn't like the message, but everybody else basically gave me huge reviews because they took a survey of every, all the speakers. But here was the thing about this, about contentment. I went to Thailand and I literally had $100 to spend. I had no money. In other words, I went to Asia on an airplane, had to take a train, and I take a bus to Thailand, stay there for a week, come back from China with only a $100 in my pocket. I had no credit cards, I had no money, no nothing. And you know why? I did that by faith. I was content. It didn't matter. I knew the Lord would protect me. I knew I would be provided. It didn't even matter. So this is important to understand. You got to learn how to be content. And nobody over there knew anything. There were millionaires and billions and millionaires in the room financially. But I was by far the wealthiest person in the room. I may have not had any money in my pocket, but they didn't know it. Guess what? I was the wealthiest person there. I believe I'm the wealthiest person on earth because of my relationship with God, my Father, and my Lord Jesus Christ. So you got to understand, you got to learn to develop contentment with your life. It says we, verse 7, it says we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And that needs to be our mindset, you guys. We need to be content. There's nothing wrong with having goals. There's nothing wrong with generating stuff and doing stuff and having stuff. But it says you need to be content if you don't. You don't need to just keep desiring more stuff. Look what it says, verse 9. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires. They plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the face and have pierced themselves with many griefs. See, people that are trying to get wealthy, they've pierced themselves and they've wandered away from God. So this is what Satan's trying to do to you guys. He's trying to get us all away from God. And what God is showing you right now is the weapons of how to stay strong with the Lord. Got a couple more scriptures and we're almost done. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. See, if you want to stay strong with the Lord, this is what you got to do, you guys. We've got to put on the full armor of God. Ephesians 6. We got to put on the full armor on a daily basis. It says, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So I want you to realize what you just read right there. Is that we got to know who our enemy is. If you don't know your enemy, how could you fight your enemy? It says the fight our, our enemy is the authorities. There are authorities in this world that run this world right now. That are either possessed by the demons. Or they're being led by them. So we need to know that that's, that's some of them. We also need to know that it's uh, some against the powers of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces. That's who our, our, our uh, struggle is against. It's not against each other. That's why I'm doing my best and really trying to allow my daughter and my son and my wife and let them do their thing and just, you know, just trying to be a lot more peaceful because it's not, it's not, the struggle is not against them. The struggle is against Satan trying to get them or Satan trying to get me or Satan trying to get you. That's who, you're, that's who the struggle is against. So here's how you do it. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The first thing you got to do is have the belt of truth. What is the truth? That you got to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. You got to keep the commandments of God. You got to keep the Sabbath day holy in His holy days. That is the truth. That is the message of the hour. There's a lot of books you can read. There's a lot of information you can read. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible. But that is the message of the secrets of the kingdom of God that God is trying to get to the world right now. There is no other message. Keep the commandments of God, get baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, and stay pure and ready for him to come get you. That's the message. 
Not, el not all the rest of it. That's it. So you need to keep that truth. Belt it around your waist so you don't walk around with your pants down. Look what it says. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. In other words, keep the commandments. What did he say he's going to put the commandments? On our heart. Right? So that's what we have to have a breastplate protecting your heart. Don't let anybody come tell you you, can, you don't have to keep the commandments. Don't let anybody tell you you don't have to keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't let anybody tell you that you can break the commandments because they're nailed to a cross. They're false teachers. And you need to leave them alone. You got to protect your heart. And it says, with your feet fitting with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. See, we need to have be peaceful and be joyful people. It says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. We need to have a faith that moves mountains right now. And you need to have a shield of faith that blocks Satan from his arrows. What it says right there, it says, it says, which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. See, Satan's trying to shoot arrows. You know what those arrows are? Doubt. Boom, here's a doubt arrow coming over you. Ah, oh, Jesus didn't do that. God, God did that to you. Or another arrow. Oh, oh, Satan, you know, you know, you 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 can just go make as much money as you want. You don't need to worry about that. You, you know, God, God loves everyone. You know, he's just shooting out flame, flaming arrows of doubt. That's what he shoots, flaming arrows of doubt. And you know what you do? Faith, faith. Nope, that's not true. That's not true. Here's the truth. Faith, faith. Boom. Just blocking those darts left to right. You know, like, like in the Matrix. You remember in the Matrix when he just, after a period of time, he got so good at it, he didn't even have to look anymore. He didn't have to dodge bullets. He just was blocking stuff. Same thing. When you get good at this, when you get good spiritually, Satan don't mess with me like that no more. I don't even get tempted about stuff. I don't get tempted with sin no more. Why? Because Satan knows. I'm just blocking it. I'm just, I got that in the fourth stage. I just know, nope, that's Satan. That's Satan talking, man, trying to do that. Nope, that girl over there, that's closed on. I'm looking at that. Nope, I ain't going that way. I go to the gym. You don't even understand. I don't, I don't go through that no more. I used to all the time. Don't struggle with that no more. So you got to understand. That's how you do it. It's with your faith. It says, take up the helmet of salvation. Meaning the helmet, what do you do? You protect your head of salvation. What should we be thinking about? See, a helmet protects your head. If you have a bike and you're riding your bike, you should have a helmet on if you're, if you're traveling in, in the streets and stuff because you can mess your head up. You mess your thinking up. But Satan wants to take that helmet and, and mess your thinking up. That's why all this 5G is to get into your head. If you notice, um, the Elon Musk guy is trying to make a brain computer so you're connected to the web. So guess who's going to be controlling your brain? The people in control of the computer. That's the technology they're trying to make right now. It's called AI, right? Isn't that interesting? So the, the, the reason why, you got to make sure your helmet of salvation, you're focused on the kingdom of God. It said in the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You need to have the Holy Spirit. You need to have the Bible. You need to know the scriptures. You need to have that. And that's how you fight Satan. And verse 18, it says, and pray in the spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. You need to be praying consistently to God. It says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all Lord's people. So another thing you can do is pray for us. Pray for myself. Pray for the brothers. Pray for the 500 pastors that we get to 1,000 in the next few days. We get to 1,000 ministry leaders that are willing to take this message around the world. So all four corners will have it. So Jesus will come and take his first fruit home. Hopefully this feast season. You know, pray for me also. Whenever I speak, words that may be given me, so I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel. And that's exactly what I've done, you guys. Twelve years ago, God gave me this mess message. And this was a mystery. It was a secret of the kingdom of God. No one on earth was teaching about the Sabbath day the way we teach. No one on earth was teaching what, about the new moon celebration or how the commandments of God all worked and how it all came together. No one. But God gave me this mystery, and I've been teaching it. So I need you to pray for me, that I stay strong, that Satan doesn't attack me in the ways that he can. For which I am an ambassador in change. Pray that I may declare it fierce, fearlessly as I should. Amen. So these are the ways that you can absolutely take on the full armor and strengthen yourself and be prepared so that you can keep God in his place. And you can love the Lord your God. So here's some of the things that you can do. Number one, start sharing my video. So I have a video, the, the video that's on our, on our, um, on our um, website, that first video up there, take that video off YouTube and share it. Share it with as many people as you can so people can know this message. Share our website. 
You know, let people know about our website. Whenever you can, tell them you're part of the ministry. Just give them the ministry website. Um, share the flyer. You guys all have a copy of the flyer. If not, go download it from the website. Download it and make it a point to share that flyer consistently. And then share our videos about baptism, about the commandments, and about the Sabbath day. You can get them right on the website. Everything is right there on the website, savedbytruth.com. Share this message with as many people as you can so that you can remember your first love and make it to the kingdom of God. Let's end it off in prayer. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for this day. And Father, thank you so much for this message and for, for you just encouraging us, God, to, to really give back to our first love. And I pray this message was encouraging for the brothers and sisters that have been um, falling that way, God. And, and Father, I want to pray for all the brothers and sisters that are being challenged right now, that this is challenging their heart and challenging their spirit. And Father, I pray that they can uh, repent, they can get back to their first love, and God, I pray that the 144,000 are all being found so we can uh, make it to the kingdom of God and you can come get us and take us home. We thank you so much for this time. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.